Pan Am 747 jumbo jet with 255 people on board has crashed just north of the Scottish border. Pan Am flight PA-103 took off from London Heathrow, bound for John F. Kennedy Airport in New York at 6.25 this evening. Several hundred people are now feared dead tonight after a Pan American Airlines jumbo jet crashed near the town of Lockerbie in Dumfries. According to Pan Am, there were 244 people on board the plane. So far, there are no reports of survivors. It's believed there have been a number of casualties on the ground as well. Really, all the way I can describe it, it was like walking into hell. Lockerbie, Scotland, December the 21st, 1988. The worst airline disaster in British history and what remains the deadliest terrorist attack in the United Kingdom to date. The bomb planted in the cargo hold of the Pan Am Jumbo detonated within an hour of the aircraft taking off. Fully laden with fuel, the explosion sent the plane plummeting back to Earth. Flight 103 disintegrated at 31,000 feet. Large parts of it smashed into the town of Lockerbie. I could see the sky. For a wee while, I wasn't very sure whether it was alive or dead, to be quite honest, because I thought I, thought I was going to die. Eleven residents of Lockerbie, along with all 259 passengers and crew aboard the flight, were killed. Bodies are literally sucked out of the plane, and then they hurtle down. Uh, obviously, they're being, if they're not dead, uh, they're, they're unconscious, they're deeply unconscious. In my opinion, had this horrible event happened during daylight hours, I would think 90% of the population of Lockerbie would have been in a mental institution. The bombing would spark an international manhunt with blame focused on Iran, Syria and Libya. Our commitment and determination to bring the evil perpetrators of this mass murder to justice continues undiminished. But the eventual conviction of a Libyan intelligence officer led many to believe those really responsible had escaped justice. Uh, this man was found guilty of murdering 270 people. Uh, 20 years uh, is less than a month per victim. And uh, somehow that doesn't sit right with me. The prosecution did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was involved in the bombing of the plane. And after serving eight years of his sentence, Abdul Basit Ali Al Magrahi, the man accused, has been released on compassionate grounds. But the scars from the attack have not healed. All they had to do was look at me. And they would see someone who was suffering. I call it Lockerbie Eyes. After a while, you get Lockerbie Eyes. My plans that night were to go and visit Morris and Dora Henry, who were great friends of mine, just lived up here in number 13. Delaying his visit would save the life of Father Patrick Keegans, whose home at the end of Sherwood Crescent was the only one spared when the wing section of Pan Am 103 came hurtling towards the ground. Dora and Morris Henry, along with nine other people, would die in the fireball that engulfed the street. It was a most enormous explosion enormous and the whole house just shook all the lights went out and I, thought, I looked at the ceiling and I thought well that's coming in and I thought I'll die here I didn't go down the ground funny enough I just stayed there I thought I'll die or I wonder if, if, if I'm injured will I be able to move it was very factual I didn't say a prayer or anything you're supposed to say a prayer aren't you or your life is supposed to flash by you. But when I looked out the back window, I could see the motorway down to my left-hand side was all in flames, and there were cars burning in, the, in this motorway. I thought, no, 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 that's, that's not in the field. So I came downstairs and opened up the front door here, and the whole area was just burning. I said, I've got to at least try and get in and see, you know, how my friends are, and at least make the effort. 
But I couldn't get any more than, let's say, about 20 or 30 yards, and the, and the smoke just drove me back. And that's when I said to myself, well, anyone who's in there has gone, because you couldn't see a thing apart from the fire. The really the only way I can describe it, it was like walking into hell. Uh, everything was on fire then, the heat was intense, the smoke was uh, really thick and, and caught you by the throat. The uh, hedges were on fire and the wind was blowing the, the fire along that, catching the drop pipes of the houses, running up the drop pipes and setting the roofs on fire. Inspector George Stobbs was one of the first policemen on the scene. The images he was confronted with still defy belief. As I came round the corner, I could remember seeing a, a wrought iron gate that had been at one of the houses. And this wrought iron gate was actually melting, just as if it was uh, butter being melted by heat. And it, it slowly uh, dripped away. That was intense to hear the heat. So it was no way that anybody who was in these houses or in the aircraft that landed in here would have had any chance of survival. They just wouldn't know what happened to them. Where the houses of Sherwood Crescent once stood, all that remained was a smouldering crater and little more than the memories of the families that had lived there. The Somervilles, Father John, Mother Rosalind, and their two children, Lindsay 10 and 13-year-old Paul, were killed. Also gone, Tom and Kathleen Flanagan and their young daughter, Joanne. Her brother, Stephen, survived. The Flanagans lived here around about the middle of Sherwood Crescent, and they really, the only per person left was, was Stephen, young chap Stephen, 15-year-old. He went out to help fix his friend's bike came back home to nothing, really. The hardest part was knowing the children in the street because there was Paul and there was Lindsay and Joanne. I knew all three children. In fact, just a couple of days before, they'd been going round the neighbours delivering Christmas cards. And I reckoned I had seen death in every almost every conceivable way you could think of, from shootings, burnings, stabbings, you name it, I had seen it. Asked any policeman what's his worst nightmare, and he said it's working with people and dead children. I was sitting, um, opening Christmas cards, when my dog started to growl, and uh, deep kind of belly growl that you know there's something that you can't hear yourself. Then all of a sudden, this noise like something coming towards the house. On the other side of Lockerbie, Ella Ramsden was alone with her dog in her home which backed onto Rosebank Crescent. It too would not escape the disaster. I went to the window to look out and the whole place was lit up in a, an orange glow no idea what it was. In fact, it went through my head that is this the end of the world? When I was a wee girl, I used to hear my granny and grandpa speaking about the end of the world coming. And then the explosion happened. This was the result of that explosion. An entire section of Pan Am 103's fuselage landed on the small dwelling. Barely anything was left standing of the house besides its terrified occupant. I could see the sky. I mean, it was wide about that. With for a wee while, I wasn't very sure whether I was alive or dead. To be quite honest, because I thought I thought I was going to die. Not a soul was in sight. So I shouted, "Can anybody hear me?" So quietly. Not a sound. So I shouted a wee bit louder, could come, somebody come and help me and my dog? And then I heard voices saying, she's still alive, let's get her out of there. Ella and her dog were pulled from the rubble, but scattered in her backyard were the bodies of 44 passengers. On her roof lay more corpses, some still strapped into their seats. There was a body lying in the middle of the road 
when I, I climbed, I had to climb over my fence. And uh, I remember saying, has anybody sent for the doctor? You know, is somebody hurt? But just with that, one of my neighbours came across the road, came out with a rug and covered the person up. It was somebody that had come out the plane. And we looked over the black, there was this pile of rubble. You know, this was four houses up. And on top of the rubble was the cot that my grandson had been lying and sleeping. Uh, well, the night before it happened. From the front window of his home, which overlooks Lockerbie's town centre, Alan Place had watched as the wreckage fell on Ella's home and Sherwood Crescent. This big, dark, sort of cylindrical shaped thing came across the sky in the direction of the town with stuff flying off it, lighted debris flying off it. It wasn't fire, but it lighted debris falling off it. It appeared to collide with houses and there was a god almighty explosion there. The retired policeman, fearing a mid-air collision had occurred, drove into town, only to be turned around and asked by a superior officer to head to the outer lying parts of Lockerbie. We came rather rapidly from Lockerbie in my own car along with the, the two young police officers, and when we got to Tindergarth Church, there was obviously something amiss as there were several cars in the field displaying their lights and cars sitting about the side of the road. It was quite a sight, this jumbo jet lying there, and uh, there was one member of the crew, an air stewardess, lying face down beside it. Uh, we turned her over uh, to see if there was any signs of life, but other than a, an exhalation of air from her, her lungs, she was obviously very dead. I did take a, a clamber up into the cockpit and I knew fine what I'd come across and uh, I wasn't disappointed, I'm afraid. But it would be the next 24 hours which would reveal the true extent of the tragedy unfolding in Lockerbie. Medical and rescue teams arrived, but it was soon apparent they would find no survivors from Pan Am Flight 103. It was just like a war zone. I mean, we had helicopters, Chinook helicopters, small helicopters. They were, they were taking off and landing about every quarter of an hour. I mean, there was bodies and body parts, debris from houses and stuff all over the shop. It was like a bomb site. It was like Beirut, in my opinion, had this horrible event happen during daylight hours. I would think 90% of the population of Lockerbie would have been in a mental institution. But both the residents of Lockerbie and the world would soon learn that this was not the result of some accident. It was an act of terror. <laughs> 